I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Marshall. Um, she is one interesting woman, I have to say. She got her medical degree from UT, another UT grad, UT Galveston, survived flooding, uh, and moved on to do a medical oncology fellowship at Yale, New Haven. And actually what you didn't put down is was in practice in medical oncology in New Mexico for a period of time before she moved to the Bay Area five? Four years ago. She's been in practice for over 24 years. She's practicing now uh, with Epicare and affiliated with the Alta Bates Summit Medical Center, specializing with a focus on breast cancer. I've shared many patients with her. My patients are very grateful they met her. Um, what you don't know, or maybe you do know, is that she is an avid jazz vocalist and lyricist. She uses music as therapy, and it's earned her the nickname with her patients as the singing oncologist. <laughs> and what you very well didn't know, as I didn't know until tonight, is that she also competes at a national level in Olympic weightlifting in the master's division. I wondered where you got those arms. All right, so I'm um, pleased to welcome Dr. Marshall to give the medical oncology update. Good evening. I'm glad everyone came tonight. Nice crowd. Um, so I'm going to give um, the update for medical oncology, and I'm going to try not to go over so we can have time for questions, too. So I may have to skip a few slides. but So the main topics I'm going to try to address tonight are the studies on the length of hormonal blockade, Something that every hormone positive breast cancer patient wants to know is how long do I have to take this stuff? Um, an update on hormone therapy for advanced disease. And that's actually just a few slides. I want to show you some of the new agents that are coming out in combination with hormone blockers and how those might actually, they're going to be studied and potentially change how long people have to take hormone blockade because we might be using some of these drugs that we use in the metastatic setting in the earlier setting, and then that may shorten the amount of hormonal blockade people have to take. I want to update on triple negative breast cancer, um, HER2 new positive, sorry, HER2 positive breast cancer, and then a big part of my talk, I want to talk about some studies that were presented on exercise and lifestyle changes that make a huge difference in recurrence rate. And it's really important that, that we get that message out to our, our family and friends and people that have breast cancer, but also these behaviors that decrease the risk of recurrence in breast cancer patients also decrease the risk of getting breast cancer in the first place. Um, the other last thing I want to touch on is endocrine disruptors and what you can do to decrease your exposure to endocrine disruptors. Okay, next slide. So I want to just talk about a meta-analysis of... Um, of the natural history of hormone-positive breast cancer, because I think people sometimes don't realize the longitude of risk that people have with estrogen-positive breast cancer. So this study was 91 trials with 46,000 women who took five years of endocrine therapy for estrogen-sensitive breast cancer. And the results um, that they looked at were the risk of distant recurrence after those five years. So from five to 20 years, the risk of recurrence. And you can see listed there, um, if you have a lower stage cancer, it would be at like 14% chance of recurrence year 5 through 20. And as you go up, it goes to 21%. If you have three, 1 to 3 lymph nodes, 29%. If you have 4 to 9 lymph nodes, 47% chance. So there's other factors that go into the risk of long-term or distant recurrence later in, in the course of, of, you know, after your 5 years of therapy. And these are the grade of the tumor. So if the tumor is slow growing or low grade, the risk is less. If it's high grade and fast growing, it is higher. Um, and then ki 67 which is a pathologic thing that we used to look at and we actually don't look at it very much anymore. But ki 67 if it's high, means it's a fast growing tumor. If it's low, it's a slow growing tumor. So looking at the stage is one thing, and then these other risk factors, that's what they found correlated with the risk of recurrence. So the implications of this meta-analysis is that the clinical pathologic factors um, help us identify who's at higher risk um, after five years of taking hormone blockers. And I want to talk with you about, because of this risk, um, that is why these extended hormonal blockade trials were done. 
uh, doing five years of therapy or six years of therapy or ten years of therapy. That's why these trials were done in order to see if we could increase the cure rate in these patients that had this late risk of, of relapse. Okay. So the other thing that I wanted just to, to put in there is that in this meta-analysis they found that in early stage breast cancer most patients have a very good overall prognosis, but greater than 50% of recurrences happen after that five-year mark. Okay, so next slide. So can we pr improve on these long-term outcomes? So this is what we know from studies that have been done, that if you take an aromatase inhibitor for five years, it's better than five years of tamoxifen. If you take Tamoxifen and an AI in a half and half manner, like half tamoxifen, half AI for five years of total, it's equivalent to five years of an AI. If you take five, 10 years of tamoxifen, it's better than five years of tamoxifen if you're just on tamoxifen alone. And that if you take it, tamoxifen for five years and then you add an AI for five extra years, that's better than taking the tamoxifen alone. So this is, these are the studies that have been published and this is what we know. Okay, so this is the most important study that was presented, though there were two other studies presented as well and then one that was presented in June about extending hormone blockade for five more years with an AI. Um, and so I'm gonna just present this one and then kind of tell you about the other ones. So the reason why they were doing this study was to see if they could improve disease-free survival. And what disease-free survival means is living without the disease for whatever period of time, for, so it's not coming back. Uh, the optimal duration of, of the adjuvant AI beyond five years was not known. We really didn't know if you extended for five more years of the AI, is it better than if you just took it for five years? We just really didn't know that question, the answer to that question. Um, it aimed to determine whether five years of letrozole, which is an AI, versus placebo improved the disease-free survival in patients who had completed five years of therapy either with an AI or a combination of tamoxifen and an AI. So the next slide. So this is the schema, and this was patients that were postmenopausal, stage one, two, or three cancers, and they had to be disease-free at five years, like they had taken five years of their therapy and hadn't had a relapse. And they were stratified for nodes, so equally balanced for node positive, node negative in the two groups, for prior tamoxifen in both groups, and for bone mineral density. So one of the things that the AI affects is our bones, and so they balanced that out so that they would have a fairness in deciding if it caused long-term side effects. So next slide. So what, the, what it showed is that there was a non-clinically significant, okay, so it didn't meet the statistical significant difference in disease-free survival. So in the patients who took placebo, they had a, a disease-free survival of 81.3 at seven years, and in the people that took letrozole, it was 3.4% better at 84.7. But statistically, it wasn't considered different. That, that wasn't considered a difference, even though there's that 3% difference. Okay, next slide. And what they did show, which was um, statistically significant, is that there were less people that had a distant recurrence or a, a, a contralateral breast cancer, like a new breast cancer. That's what it showed is that there was less people that got a new breast cancer, and we know that it has a chemopreventive effect of decreasing the risk of a second breast cancer. And it also, the people that took it for five years had a lower risk of distant recurrence. And that was statistically significant. So, you know, this is um, a study that's not clean. We would like for everything to show improvement or nothing to show improvement, but what it, what we're taking from this is that for patients that have a higher risk of recurrence, so people that are higher stages, higher, bigger tumors, positive lymph nodes, high grade tumors, um, those patients um, we should consider uh, talking with them about the extending hormonal blockade because of this statistically significant improvement in, in distant recurrence and in decreasing the risk of a breast cancer event in the breast. Next slide. Actually, go back one, sorry. 
The one thing that they did show is that after you've taken five years of an aromatase inhibitor, because these women had taken aromatase inhibitor at least for part of their therapy, um, there was not a difference between the two groups in osteoporotic fractures. So that's important because a lot of people worry about their bones on these medicines. And they did show that after you took it for two and a half years in the extended setting, there was a risk for vascular events like strokes and heart attacks. There was an increased risk after two and a half years on the group that took letrozole for the five extra years. Okay. So we need to carefully assess each patient, um, look at the, the age of the patient, the nodal status, the, the size of the tumor, whether the woman has other medical problems that would make them at risk for taking it ex in an extended way, whether they tolerated the drug for the first five years, um, and then use the bone density to help us also make that determination um, in order to uh, decide individually with our patients um, whether or not to extend it. But there's really not a right or wrong answer that you have to take it for 10 or you're doing this terrible thing to yourself or you shouldn't, you know, you should only take it for five. The other studies that were presented also did not show a difference in disease-free survival, all of them, um, and none of them showed an overall survival benefit. So at the end of the day, you were not likely to live longer if you took it for five extra years versus if you didn't. So the overall survival was not different between the groups. Now one caveat about these studies of extending hormonal blockade and late recurrences is that it takes a long time sometimes to see a difference. So this is reporting out at seven years. So sometimes it takes a 10-year follow-up or a 15-year follow-up or a 20-year follow-up to see a big difference where it's significant. And so these studies are going to be updated. You know, they're probably gonna be updated every several years and once they see some difference, they're gonna report it again, so it may change. But at this time, your oncologist would not be wrong to offer you extended hormone blockade. It would also not be wrong to not offer it because there's not a disease for your overall survival benefit. Okay? Okay, you can skip that. So there's, there's a couple of um, genomic scores, which are these genetic uh, profiling that we do on tumors. And they had one study that looked at um, whether they could predict which patients are going to benefit from hormonal blockade. And what they found was there's one that's available in the United States called Breast Cancer, Cancer Index, and there's two that they studied which are not available in America. They're available in Europe. And the Breast Cancer Index and these other two in Europe were able to predict in node-negative patients a group of patients that were at very low risk for recurrence and thus do not need to take a uh, hormone blockade past five years. So the test that's available in the United States that we can use is a test called the Breast Cancer Index. And if you have, if you had a tumor that's node negative, it is reasonable to consider asking your doctor for that test if you're having a hard time and you, and you don't want to stay on the medicine, it might help you make that decision. Um, in node positive patients, there's no uh, test in America that's available that we can use to determine this. Um, the two that were available that showed benefit were only, they're only available in Europe. Um, this slide is, is I wanted to use the slide to show you how complicated the signaling to the estrogen receptor is. And, whoa, sorry. I'm not very. Okay, so this is the surface of the cell. And these are all the ways and signals and molecules that are used to signal down to the estrogen receptor gene. And so the, the drugs that we're developing now are targeting these different, these different pathways in order to figure out how to kill estrogen-positive breast cancer more effectively. So next slide. So this is just, it's a, it's a chart of the different therapies that are available before you ever have to go on chemotherapy for metastatic disease and estrogen positive breast cancer. And some of the drugs that are on this, this slide are, are what they call mTOR inhibitors, everolimus. Some of them are um, CK inhibitors like Ibrant. Many of you might know these drugs. 
Fazlodex and the aromatase inhibitors and tamoxifen. And what we're doing now is combining these drugs that target those pathways I just showed with hormonal blockade. And they're trying to figure out what combinations are most effective and then developing second and third line drugs that target it, some of which would be oral instead of injections or maybe they would be more effective. And so there's a lot of, right now, not so much combining, I mean, not so much like combining new drugs, but developing new drugs that will be combined with hormonal blockade. And I just wanted to put that up there to just show you how complicated it is. But the, the second point I wanted to make about it is that these drugs that we're using in the metastatic setting that we know are effective, we're also using them in the adjuvant setting. So a patient that gets their chemotherapy and their radiation and their um, surgery, instead of just going on hormonal blockade, they might enter a trial where they take hormonal blockade, but they also take Ibrands, the CK inhibitor, for a year. Or they might take Everolimus for a year. Or they are, if they're triple negative, they may take Olaparib for a year if they're BRCA positive. So we're using these drugs in the, that we use in the metastatic setting earlier to try to see if it makes a difference in the cure rate. Next slide. So now I'm gonna switch over to triple negative breast cancer. Um, triple negative breast cancers are biologically aggressive with higher risk of relapse in, the early, in early stage disease and decreased overall survival in the metastatic setting. And the problem is that we don't have really good targets for triple negative breast cancer, and chemotherapy is the standard of care in treating patients. So go to the next slide. So this is just a slide of all the different kinds of triple negative. So when people say I have triple negative breast cancer, you have triple negative breast cancer, but you might have one of those six types. And there's actually seven types now. I just don't have the seventh one on the slide. So those are all different, and they respond differently to treatment. So we're trying to figure out which one of those respond to which treatments. But it's not one disease, it's, it's a bunch of different diseases. Next slide. What we have found, um, Dr. Goodwin mentioned neoadjuvant treatment when you give chemo first before surgery. So what we found in triple negative breast cancers, which is not true in triple, I mean in, in estrogen positive breast cancer, is that if a person has chemotherapy first with triple negative and they don't have a complete response, the outcome and the risk of relapse is higher. And this graph just shows that the top line, which is the blue line on the right-hand graph, is, is showing that if you have a complete response, you have a very high cure rate. And if you have a non-complete response, the curve for survival is much lower. And, and that's because if you can't eradicate all that cancer, there's probably some silent metastases in the body seeds in the body, and they come back. So next slide. So we're using um, this understanding to try to target patients who, have, who don't have a complete response. We want to try to figure out how to target those silent seeds that could be out there and picking those patients when they don't have a complete response because they have a worse outcome. Next slide. So last year at San Antonio, they presented this trial from Japan. And this was in people with um, all types of breast cancers. They included triple negatives and also estrogen positive breast cancer who got chemotherapy and did not have a complete response. They gave them something called Zolota, which is a chemotherapy agent that we use in breast cancer. And they got this, um, and what they found is that the triple negative breast cancer patients had a better outcome and a better cure rate when they got this chemotherapy, extra chemotherapy afterwards on this trial. Next slide. So um, that was like the first kind of published study about this. So we actually have this study open here through BADI, the Bay Area Tum Tumor Institute, and also Ready. And this is a study where if a patient gets chemo with triple negative breast cancer, does not have a complete response, and um, they can go on to this trial where they're randomized to get extra chemo, either carboplatinum or Zolota, to try to better the outcome. And this trial is comparing carboplatinum versus Zolota. And this is a very important trial. And it is a trial that's available in our community because in triple negative breast cancer patients who don't have a complete response, it gives them an option 
to get extra treatment which might make the difference in them being cured or not. And I just wanted to make everyone aware that it is available in our community and it was presented at San Antonio as a, one of the most important trials to try to improve upon the outcomes in these patients. The other trial that's really important um, is this trial using immunotherapy. So everybody's heard about immunotherapy, right? It's like super hot and it's hot for a reason because it's helping a lot of patients with certain kinds of tumors. Um, this is a study using immunotherapy in patients who have, do not have a complete response after neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And these patients can go on the trial I mentioned before and have chemo, and they still are eligible to go on to immunotherapy afterwards, or they could just go on to immunotherapy. This is a really important trial also to try to see whether immunotherapy could improve survival in patients and improve the disease-free survival in patients with triple negative breast cancer. And it's approaching it by a different mechanism of action, not just chemotherapy. There's also this drug um, called setuzumab, and this is a antibody. This is the first antibody that they've used in um, triple negative breast cancer, and it's, it targets a little molecule that's on the surface of triple negative breast cancer. And they did a, a study where they gave this antibody alone with no chemotherapy, so it's not as toxic as chemotherapy, in people that had been heavily pretreated. And they had a response rate of about 29%, which is better than a lot of chemotherapies in that situation. So it's a, something that's new and it's being studied, and that was a phase one study. They're now going to try to combine it with other treatments to see if together it could work even better, including combining it with immunotherapy. Next uh, slide. You can keep going. Okay, so everybody's interested in the immune system. And we used to think that the, the breast cancer did not elicit an immune response. We used to think that. When I was training 25 years ago, that's what people thought. Um, this is um, a picture of breast cancer with, an, with the immune system trying to attack it. So these bigger cells are the cancer cells, and these little black dots that are everywhere are, are lymphocytes. And we call them tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, or TILs. Um, what they found is that TILs are really important, not in treatment, but they're really important in prognosis. And they're finding that certain kinds of breast cancer, if they have a high TIL count, have a much better survival rate and outcome. Next slide. So this is a meta-analysis of, of 3,771 patients, and they showed that high TILs are more frequent in triple negative breast cancer, and then next, second in line is HER2 positive breast cancer, and least of all in luminal cancers, which are the hormone positive breast cancers. TILs are linked to an increased pathologic complete remission. So if you, if you have a triple negative or a HER2 positive breast cancer and you have a lot of TILs, more likely to have had a pathologic complete remission. So showing that the immune system is having some effect on those patients to help them get into remission. High TILs were associated with an increased overall survival in triple negative breast cancer and HER2 positive breast cancer. Um, now, in Luminal cancers, the estrogen positive breast cancer, it was the opposite. Uh, low TILs were associated with a better overall survival in hormone positive breast cancer. And why they think that um, is that maybe the, the tumors that are estrogen positive that are causing a big immune response are probably worse tumors. And the ones that are kind of more mellow and slow growing, maybe they don't elicit an immune response and that patient actually has a better outcome. They don't actually know the reason for that yet, but it's an observation. Next slide. So um, there's a, the one thing I want to bring out in this slide is that the overall survival is associated with the TIL level. So in HER2 positive breast cancer patients, they showed a linear impact. For each 10% increase in TILs, there was an 11% reduction in death. That's a pretty strong association of the immune system helping that patient. Next uh, slide. And this, this slide just shows that if the TILs were high, the events that patient would have would be low. 
I mean, the, the outcomes were better, and if the TILs were low, they had a worse outcome. This was in HER2 positive breast cancer patients. So next thing on HER2 positivity um, and, and cancer that I want to bring out to patients to make you aware of it is what we call de-escalation of therapy. So just like Dr. Goodwin's talking about de-escalating the intensity of surgery and the amount of surgery we do in the armpit, we're trying to also think about it in medical oncology, who could we give less treatment to and they'd still have a good outcome? Who could we give less chemo to or no chemo to? Um, so this is a, a study that was done, it was a phase two study, um, and it was in small breast cancers, less than three centimeters, node negative, ER positive or ER negative, and HER2 positive. And it was giving people 12 weeks of therapy and then followed by Herceptin. Okay, you can go to the next one. And what it showed is an excellent disease-free survival. Um, it showed that the patients actually had a 98.7% three-year disease-free survival. And they're following these patients out and the curve is staying flat. And so these patients are not relapsing and they're, they got about two months less of chemotherapy. They got two drugs rather than three. Their neuropathy risk is lower because they only got one drug that can affect the, ner the nerves rather than two drugs. So it's a way that we can, that it's a good trial of showing that we could give a little bit less therapy in these lower risk patients and still have a good outcome. Okay, so I wanna talk about um, energy balance in cancer. So um, cancer surgery and treatment are associated with several long-term side effects, including weight gain, cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, anxiety, bad quality of life from side effects of treatment, um, and also, even worse, recurrence and new cancer diagnoses. So preventing weight gain and promoting weight loss physical activity and healthy eating can prevent and control some of these side effects, as well as lower the risk of recurrence and mortality. Next slide. So this is just a slide about how exercise of three hours a week decreases your risk of getting breast cancer. And it actually, there's a bunch of cancers above it, which also show a decreased risk of cancer, of getting the cancer in the first place, if you exercise. Now this slide is physical activity after a breast cancer diagnosis. And people that exercised three hours a week had a 50% reduction in the risk of recurrence. That's, that's like taking your hormone blocker reduces your risk by 50%. So if you exercise three hours a week, it lowers your risk of recurrence. And most of the benefit was seen in hormone-positive breast cancer patients, but it also was seen in other types as well. So this is um, a study that was done showing insulin levels in the blood and breast cancer prognosis. So as the insulin levels go up, the risk of distant recurrence and death go up. So the resting insulin in our body, in our circulation, Insulin is a growth factor for breast cancer, and if it's high, it helps breast cancer grow. And if it's lower, it's hostile to breast cancer and helps breast cancer stop growing. So this is a very important concept because what we wanna do is do things in our life, in our lifestyle, to lower our insulin level as well as some other things in our blood. Next slide. So this is a, a study by a woman named Melinda Irwin who's really, right at the front of this field of helping show and prove how exercise and lifestyle choices can change things in the body and, and, change, um, and change outcomes for patients. And this was a study on exercise and the percent change in insulin and what they call insulin growth factors at six months. These people were exercising two and a half to three hours a week of walking. They weren't lifting weights, they weren't running, they weren't like swimming, but you could do those things for your exercise if you liked it, but they were just walking, most of them. And you can see on the yellow, those are the exercises, exercisers, the insulin level and the insulin growth factors went down in the blood, and the people who weren't exercise, exercising it was going up. Next slide. This also, and this is why I wanted her to tell you why I'm a weightlifter. 
Because when you lift weights, it, your, your muscles get depleted of, of glucose, and it makes you really extremely sensitive to, estrogen, I mean, to insulin. And so if you eat carbs after you exercise, it goes into your muscle to re to refuel uh, your muscle. That's what weightlifting, that's why weightlifters can eat more carbs. But I'm not trying to get everybody to eat carbs, but what it showed in patients who lift, lifted weights, and this was 40 minutes of weightlifting a week. This wasn't like a bunch of weightlifting. This was a little bit of weightlifting. These people had this massive decrease in their insulin level. And they also had changes in other markers like weight, um, sorry, waist and hip circumference, but they didn't necessarily lose weight, but they still got this nice effect of their insulin level going down. So this study is, is um, a study that is being, was, was done, which was really interesting. It was a study where they were trying to figure out with three or four weeks of exercise, could they show that there was a difference in the breast tissue itself and the markers of expression of the breast cancer? or the breast tissue. So what they did was, at, at diagnosis, the patients got a biopsy. Then they had four weeks of exercise, three to four weeks of exercise, and the control group did mind-body uh, awareness, like meditation, stress reduction, but they didn't exercise. And then the exercising group just walked two and a half to three hours a week. They did this and then they looked at gene expression and quality of life, and then breast tumor markers. So, go to the next slide. What they showed in this is that there was a significant upregulation of these pathways that I have circled on the left. These pathways, these gene expression pathways, were upregulated only in the people who exercised and not in the people who just had stress reduction. So, next, um, next slide. So when they looked at all those genes that were expressed and how those were upregulated, they were pathways that were related to decreasing inflammation and to increasing immunity. So they were pathways, you know, people are, when they come into my clinic, they're all taking turmeric or they're taking things to decrease inflammation. I mean, people are really educated about this, even though they haven't necessarily seen the slides about it. But that, but exercise by itself, even without any supplementation, can turn on those pathways that help that. So this was, this is something that correlated with animal models. And the big point of this is it was three to four weeks of exercise and it showed this difference. That's not very much. So it's, it's something I want to inspire you guys to exercise. Next slide. Um, this is just a, a slide about um, insulin resistance, inflammation, and how it affects all of those pathways at the top, which go down and, and talk to the genes and then talk and, and drive the cancer growth. Blocking those helps block those gene pathways from being turned on. Next, next slide. Also, exercise showed decrease in cancer-related fatigue. So I tell my patients that all the time, if you exercise, you won't be so as tired, but it's getting out there to do it when you already feel really tired that's hard, but it really will help you not be as tired if you do it. And the next slide also was a, a study that showed that if you exercise, you're gonna have less side effects from your aromatase inhibitor. People that exercised had less pain, um, less pain severity and less pain interference with their daily activities if they exercised. And that's kind of counterintuitive because you think, oh, I'm hurting. If I go out and walk, I'm going to hurt more. But it actually turned out to be the opposite. Um, so this is a study that I wanted to highlight. It's a study that we have, that we have available um, at, at Batty as well as Ready. We're offering it through our office. And it's... Um, it's a weight loss study in stage one to three breast, sorry, stage two and three breast cancer patients, so higher risk. And what we're doing is, what, it, what the study does is it, it has an intervention of just health education about weight loss versus active intervention where someone's calling the patient and trying to actively intervene and they're trying to see whether it makes a difference in their success and decreasing risk of recurrence and mortality. So, um, what I 
want to talk about this study is that we need to, we have to integrate everything. We have surgery, we have chemotherapy, we have radiation, we have survivorship. But in the center of it, we need to also look at our lifestyles and the things that we actually have control over. You don't have control over whether you have breast cancer or not, oftentimes, but you do have control about what you do to try to decrease your risk if you're educated about it. And so that's what I think we need to get out to our community.